Okay, I want to talk um, a little bit about linearization, which is um, the beginning of a study in calculus about approximating functions. And you'll see more of this if you take Calc 2 when you see Taylor polynomials. So we are talking about first degree Taylor polynomials today when we talk about linearization. Um, and, and so it's a whole branch of kind of thinking about functions in maybe a different way than you have before. Um, so it is in some ways, like all of this is about applications of the derivatives. It's an application of the tangent line. So we'll be finding tangent lines here today. Um, and um, it is a really useful um, way to think about tangent lines um, apart from the way that we have to understand derivatives. Okay. Um, so one of the things I want to maybe remind you of is that there are a lot of complex phenomenon in the world And in mathematics and in other scientific disciplines, we write mathematical models to try and capture what's happening. Right. And in Calc 1, we write, um, you know, models that sort of have a lot of simplifying assumptions or things like that. Um, and then as you get more complex, the models can become more complex and um, maybe capture more of the phenomenon that you have. When you're trying to capture complex phenomenon with mathematical models, routinely, you'll end up kind of unsurprisingly with complex functions. And um, sometimes, and maybe not sometimes, almost all the time, you're thinking about um, functions in two ways. One, sort of, um, how close it comes to um, the actual phenomenon. So maybe we can call that accuracy to what you really observe um, versus simplicity, meaning how easy is it then to work with to figure out other things. And there's routinely sort of this, um, not always, but sometimes this push and pull between them. Okay, so there's um, approximating functions. The stuff we're talking about today has like over here, I have a complex function. And today I'm gonna turn that into a linear approximation using the derivative. And mostly I'm going to do that because this maybe complex function has a lot of accuracy or maybe accuracy over a huge domain. And this linear approximation over here will get sort of close enough like accurate enough over a smaller domain. So what we call kind of like a local approximation, again, in the same way that I'm using the words local maximum versus global maximum or local minimum versus global minimum, this is locally kind of good enough for the work that we're going to do. And if I don't care about like an entire of a, like a huge domain and I really am looking at a localized area, it can make my life much simpler. And especially when you talk about 
um, using, let's say, computational power to do these things will, like, all of these things over here tend to be algebraic functions. Things involving, like, plus, minus, multiplication, division, maybe roots, right? But kind of these algebraic functions. And over here, maybe you'll have more transcendental functions like cosine, sine, trig, natural log, exponentials, right? And all um, like those hyperbolic functions. And there's just sort of a level of complexity when you need them to um, compute anything. Um, okay, let me see if I can get another page. Oh, oh okay. Um, so I'm going to do an example. So, and I just want to think real quick about this function, f of x is equal to the square root of x, right? And I want to draw it, and then I want to draw a tangent line and just um, think about this. So I have this here. My square root function looks like this. Passes through here, passes through 1, 1, and passes through 4, 2. Okay. And then I want to draw, let's say, the tangent line at 1. And maybe, and I'm just going to estimate it right here. Right? So there's the tangent line at 1. And for sure, and maybe I'll just sort of even extend this like this, for sure, way out here, you see that these two functions have a lot of difference, right? So if I plugged 3 into the square root function, I get something here. And if I plug 3 into this tangent line, I get something sort of further away. So the distance between the y output values is big. So distance or difference but if you look right here around one let's say in this local area the distance is not that big first of all at one the distance is zero because that's where I put my tangent line but even across here these distances aren't that big, right? And within that sort of those parentheses, we say that this tangent line is a fairly okay approximation for the square root function, right? So we're going to, so like, again, it depends on the underlying function, how good this approximation is. But here, the idea is, is that I would use this tangent line as an approximating function And we call that approximating function L of X. This is like for the linearization. And L of X approximates this original function f of x equals square root of x near x equal to 1. And as I move further and further away from 1, the approximation gets worse in this case. Um, and like so, and then, and we're not going to talk about this today, but the, the whole other part of this study is to understand the error in this approximation.
So it's not like mathematicians are just being like, oh, it's sort of good enough, look at looks close enough. There's definitely a lot of very rigorous work to understand how much error you're introducing into the model by switching to this simpler linear approximation, but you've made your life much simpler because this tangent line or the equation of this tangent line at one um, should be much simpler than the actual function, right? So, and I just wanna find this tangent line and remind you how to do that. So let's try to find L of X, which is just the tangent line at x is equal to 1. Okay, So 1, to find the, any line, I need slope and a point. So like all this graphing work we've done, to get a point, I have x equal to 1. To find the y value, I'll just plug it into the original function. And so this is the square root of 1, which is also 1. So my point is 1, 1, right? And to find the slope, I take the derivative. And then I plug in 1. So I get a slope of 1 half. So I have this slope of 1 half and the point 1, 1. So and then I'm going to... Um, find the equation of the line. So, and I'm gonna use point slope form. One, one half x minus one. One half x minus one half one. And I think I get one half x plus one half. And this is what we call the linearization. Okay. Now I know, again, I want to talk and like, we're not going to do these error estimates, but I want to look a little bit about at the error. So for example, And maybe I want to think, like, how close are these? Is L of X to my actual F of X, right? So I'm thinking of these two functions. They behave similarly and have similar Y values near one, but probably not far away from one, right? Okay. So for sure, and maybe I'll put it over here. Um, you know what, let's do this one. So let's do, if x is one, maybe we'll make a just a chart to look at them, f of x, and I'll look at l of x. So for sure, I know that the output of both of these is one. So here, this error, Like if I look at the dis difference between them is zero. There's no error. They're exactly the same, right? But if I look at the square root, let's do, look at the value at 1.5. So I want to go back up to maybe this chart and I'm going to look right here and I'm going to go up and I'm going to measure this distance between this red line and the black actual function, right? So if I go into 1.5, um, the actual square root of 1.5 is 1.2247, round, okay? And then if I plug 1.5 into L of x, this function, right? So I'm going to plug in 1.5, or that's the same thing as 3 halves, I'll get something like three fourths plus one half. Um, and so I think I get maybe five fourths here. 1.25. 
And so you see right here this error is in the hundreds. Oh, that's the wrong place on the left one, right? It should be right here. 1.25, right there. But you have an error of like, let's say 0 0.0, you know, is it 2.5? Something like this. Does that make sense? Okay. So it's not very big. And maybe depending on your application, it's a small enough error that it doesn't matter. And then you have traded, like I had, and maybe I want to make sure here, like I found this on my calculator. And I calculated this by hand. And so when we think about the complexity of using these two models, this L of X is inherently simpler. Now, as I move away from one, the approximation we expect to get much, much worse. So like, let's say if I looked at 11, so the actual square root of 11 should be something like 3.31662, right? And that sort of makes sense because it's between 3 and 4, between the square root of 9 and square root of 16. And L of 11, if I plug that in, I get 6. And so you see over here, the error is closer to like a 2.7. So it's really a big magnitude, right? Okay. Now, the reason this estimate here is so bad is because 11 is far away from x equal to 1, where I wrote this tangent line. Right? So I used 1, x equal to 1, as a very, you know, plays a very serious role in writing this approximation. But, and again, the linearization is only good locally. So maybe I can get a better approximation. So let's look at this. Can we get a better approximation? by choosing a different, what we call center point. So in the previous example, x is equal to 1 was the center. And it's far away from 11, so I don't really expect it to be that good, right? But now let me think, like, if my center is closer to 11, Is the approximation better? And the, we think, sort of intuitively, that it should be. Right? Okay, so I'm going to choose a new center. And whenever you're choosing a center, you want it to do a couple of things. You want it to be a nice point, a nice input for the function. So in this case, my function is f of x equal to the square root of x. So for this particular function, nice inputs are perfect squares. again, for the square root function. If I have the cube root function, I'm not going to use perfect squares. Those aren't nice anymore when combined with this function, right? 
So I want to choose, for sure, I know 11 is between two perfect squares, 9 and 16. It's closer to 9, so the distance here is 2, and the distance here is 5. So I might choose 9 because it's closer and it's still nice. So, okay, so I'm going to choose x equal to 9 as the center. Right? And so I'm going to go through this process again. I'm going to write a new linearization. And you're kind of thinking, oh, that feels like a lot of work to get a new estimate. But it's not that much work because I already found the derivative. So I really just have to evaluate the derivative at 9 and evaluate the function at 9. And I've chosen 9 because it's a nice value in both of those functions, right? So um, if x equal to 9, f of 9 should just be 3, and f prime of 9 should be 1 over 2 times the square root of 9, or 3 should be 1 sixth, right? So at this point, 9 comma 3 and slope is 1 sixth. And then I'm going to find this equation of a line. So new linearization. Same function, but the center is x is equal to 9. So y minus 3 equals 1 sixth x minus 9. So I get y is equal to 1 sixth x minus 9 sixth plus 3. Three in terms of six is eighteen six. And so I get y is equal to one six x plus nine six. And that's one six x plus, and then I'm going to reduce this and I'll get three halves. Okay, and this is my new linearization. And when I, again, I do this estimate, and I'm thinking about at x is equal to 11, right? So I've done all this work to hopefully get a better estimate at x equal to 11. So at x equal to 11, again, the square root of 11 is 3.3166. And L of 11 should be 1 6 times 11 plus 3 halves. This is 11 over 6 plus, and I'm going to go back to 9 6 here, and I get 20 over 6, which is 10 thirds, which is about 3.3 repeated. So you see that by moving the center now, these are much closer together, significantly closer together. You get a much better estimate by moving the center closer. And it's actually not that hard to <clears throat> create these functions and then just move the center around to wherever you locally need it to be. Okay? Okay. So I want to do maybe... Um, one more example and um, think about how we sometimes use these. So I want to approximate. Let's do the cube root of 7.2 using a linearization. Okay. And the goal here is one, um, again, I want to identify the function. Two, choose a good center. Uh, 
that will be close to my input and also nice in the function. So we'll look at a couple potential centers and choose between them. And then three, we want to write the linearization. Or tangent line at that center. And then four, actually approximate the function value. Okay. So I'm just going to kind of do these in red. So the function that like here for sure is the number or the input that I'm thinking of. So if that red box is the input, then the function that I am trying to approximate is f of x is equal to a cube root function, right? So I want to plug something in, take the cube root of it. The, taking the cube root is the action part of this function, OK? Now, choose a good center. It needs to be close to 7.2. Again, I want things that work well, nice in this function. Because it's a cube root function, I'm looking for things that are perfect cubes. And maybe you don't know what perfect cubes are. Well, let's say I'm just going to take one and start cube it. So one times one times one is one. So that's a perfect cube. Two, if two to the third power is eight, three to the third power is 27. And right here I have this guy sitting smack, hmm, not there. Oh, it's not in the middle there. It's in the middle over here. Hold on right in between there. So maybe my two choices are one or eight, and I'm for sure closer to eight. So I think there's likely no doubt that eight is a better center. Um, if you chose a center of one, it would give you a much simpler even tangent line, but I'm gonna choose eight because it's closer. Now I'm gonna write this linearization, okay? So again, for part three, I'm going to move maybe some of this stuff. OK, so for this part three, I'm going to find um, this value. So I think your book uses A for the center. A equals eight. And we're going to find M is F prime at eight. So I need to find f prime. Um, f prime of x is equal to, let's go back. I don't, we're doing the cube root function. So let me write this down. f of x is equal to the cube root of x, which is x to the one third. OK. So <clears throat> if I'm finding the y value, let's do this part first. Y is equal to the cube root of 8, which should just be 2. So plugging y into the original function. Then the first derivative of this should be f prime of x is 1 third x. The 1 third minus 1 should be negative 2 thirds power. Or if I'm going to evaluate this, 1 over 3 cube root of x, and then I'm going to square it, because that's probably easier, because I picked a perfect cube, right? So OK, so this is my f prime. And now I'm going to plug in 8 to that. f prime of 8 is 1 over 3. Cube root of 8 is 2, and then I'm going to square it. So 1 over 3 times 2 squared. So that should be 1 12. OK. And then I'm going to move this down one more time, because we need a little bit more space. OK. 
And finally, I'm going to write this equation, right? So let me write it. So y minus, my y value is here too, is equal to 1 12th x minus 8. This is the center right here, right? So I have to get a nice tangent line. Don't get confused because some people will start to put in this 7.2. I have to write the tangent line completely dependent on the center, and then later it's useful to approximate what's happening at 7.2. So I get 1 12th x minus 8 over 12 plus 2. y is equal to 1 12th x. 8 over 12 will simplify to be two-thirds, and then two in terms of thirds should be six-thirds. So I think I get one-twelfth x plus four-thirds as this linearization. Okay, and now I'm going to approximate the function value. And again, I'm thinking here that f of x is approximated by L of X, right? So we might write something like this, L of X is approximately F of X. And I want to know what the cube root of 7.2 is, but I just want to approximate it. So I'm going to find L of 7.2, and then that will give me this approximation, right? Okay, so I'm going to take this 1 12th X plus four thirds and approximate. Seven point two plus four thirds. Okay. And then we're gonna just kind of do this math. So let's think, I think I can just do this by hand. Hand. Let me see this. 7.2 divided by 12. What do I want to do here? Hmm, hmm, hmm. I think this goes in evenly, actually. Well, let's see. 12, 24, 8. I think I'm going to get six times. So here's what I'm thinking. Like 12 times 1 is 12, and times 2 is 24. 3 is 36. 4 is 48. Times 5, I get 60, and times 6, I get 72. You see that? So I think I'm going to get 0.6 right here as 7.2 divided by 12. And maybe I'll do, I'll just check it real quick like this. So 12, 6, 7, and moon. Okay, so nice. 0 0.6 plus 4 thirds. And then, and this is like six tenths plus four thirds. Lots of fractions. Mm. Oh, this simplifies to be three fifths thirds. Then I'm going to do times three here and times five here to get a common denominator. Twenty nine over fifteen. Okay, so we think it's a and like look, twenty nine over fifteen is also not that nice, but it's around somewhere around two ish, right? And I know that seven point two is close to eight, and the cube root of eight is actually equal to two. So this makes me think that I didn't mess up 
in my approximation, even if I don't have a calculator to check what the cube root of 7.2 is, right? So this is not exactly two, but it's close enough that it makes me think like it's a little bit smaller than the two, which it should be. Um, and then I get this. Okay. So this is linearization. It's a very interesting and like then in Taylor polynomials, you'll talk about how to expand this to be quadratics or cubics or anything using um, higher order derivatives, using like the second derivative, third derivative, all of that good stuff. Um, and then I think also in, in Calc 2, you then talk about um, an error approximation for these um, polynomials. Okay, I have one more thing to talk about, and it's really more as we look forward to doing integrals. And I just want you to understand um, differential forms because we'll use them a little bit in integrals. And I just want um, you to kind of understand a little bit where they come from. Um, so, th and this will be like just a little bit of understanding. So calculus was developed by over by many people but two of the main people that um, we have that helped um, develop it are Newton and a guy named Leibniz. And because they developed it separately, not together, um, and over different eras of time, they used different notation. And so Leibniz has this notation that we routinely use today, this dy by dx. And Newton had this notation, this y actual dot. And then later, a guy named Lagrange used this notation y prime of x, which is so like these are maybe the two that we mostly use. You do see this y dot in some um, some applied places, so in some disciplines. Um, so you'll you'll see this different sort of notation meaning the same thing. Okay, Leibniz also used this idea of a differential in which we think of dy and dx as sort of two different um, measures, and we think of them as tiny, tiny, infinitesimal, um, uh, you know, meanings of this delta y over delta x. So the derivative for sure comes from a delta y over delta x computation, right? So it comes from this average rate of change. And you get this change in y over change in x. And then as we let the limit as h go to 0, these become really small and get this sense of the instantaneous rate of change, right? So in the limit as h is going to 0, we kind of think of that as this delta, this dx, which is the differential of x, it's something really, really small, a really, really small, but positive um, change in x, right? And so the same thing we think of here, this dy is a really, really small, but still positive, but maybe non-zero is maybe the better way to say this, change in y. And in fact, I'm gonna do this. Not, it doesn't necessarily have to be positive, but it's not zero, change in x. Right. So you think about it as like the tiny, like as you think of infinity as being the biggest possible quantity that we can think of. I think of these differentials dx and dy as the smallest value. So there's not anything 
sort of like, you know, you think of it as the smallest value possible that's not zero, okay? So we define this differential dy itself by thinking of this and treating in some ways, and this is real hand wavy, like not rigorous at all, by thinking of this guy as a fraction. And I'm going to multiply both sides of this equation. And then I define dy as the derivative of f and then times this tiny amount, dx. So, and there's not really anything else magical about this. This is in some ways, and I maybe want to make sure that you understand this, like in the same way that I could write dy over dx and write f prime of x, and that those would be the same thing, dy this one, the differential, is just another way to talk about the relationship between the derivative and these changes in y and changes in x, these infinitesimal changes. Okay, so I'll have you do, like, in fact, let's just do one problem. Find the differential dy for f of x is equal to x squared minus 3x. So literally, I, I want to show you this, like, it really is just a change in notation. It's, um, at this point, not substantive for students, meaning, like, but we'll use, I, if you know what's coming, you'll know that we do integrals of f of x dx, and this guy right here is the differential. So I'd like to introduce it to make sure that you're kind of um, know where it comes from. But so for this function, um, f prime is 2x minus 3, and the differential dy is just 2x minus 3 dx. And like literally, that's the end of the problem for finding the differential. So in Calc 1, I think it feels a little bit weird to talk about differentials because you're like, I don't know what these are used for. Like, why are you even talking about this? And I think that's legitimate. We do use them in integrals. Um, but also, there are whole branches of mathematics, which if you end up needing differentials, you deal with them more rigorously, you define them more rigorously, and all of that good stuff. So uh, maybe I just want to leave it here for right now just as a sense of a different sort of notation to think about um, derivatives and um, how we think about them um, or write them just notationally. And then we'll, they'll pop up again when we do integrals and we can talk a little bit more about them. Okay. Okay. So that's it for linearization and differentials. Um, please let me know if you have questions and I will see you next week.